From absolutely legendary one-liners to the shocking deaths of certain big screen icons. It didn't matter that these directors were all in charge of bringing each of these scenes to screen, they still didn't properly understand the following well-known movie moments. So I'm Gareth, this is What Culture, and here are 10 iconic movie moments the director didn't understand. Number 10, George Lucas's tinkering showed that he did not grasp the weight of Darth Vader's sacrifice. Anakin Skywalker's rise as a Jedi Knight, fall and transformation into Darth Vader, and eventual redemption is one of cinema's greatest character arcs, and has served audiences with many of Star Wars' greatest emotional beats. The journey was capped off in 1983's Return of the Jedi, where we see a Force Ghost version of Anakin following his return to the side of the light and defiance of Emperor Palpatine. Unfortunately, George Lucas saw it fit to replace Sebastian Shaw with Hayden Christensen in the 2004 edition of the threequel, to the ire of many, many, many fans. His justification was that his prequel era visage was fitting for the scene, as that was the moment Anakin died and Darth Vader was born. Admittedly, the explanation somewhat makes sense, but only if one ignores Vader's sacrifice at the end of the Richard Marquand directed trilogy closer. Seeing an older Anakin in his spectral form holds way more weight as it shows that the former Jedi Knight was indeed saved from the clutch of the Force's dark side, and died as a man far different from the ruthless Vader. Lucas's change undermines this redemptive moment, brief as it was, as well as Luke's efforts to bring his father back to the side of the light, which was in itself a weighty act given that the young Skywalker had nearly killed his father only moments before. Now I want to know really quickly, what is your favourite Star Wars moment of all time? Was it Hayden Christensen turning back up as a Force ghost or something else? You let me know in the comments section down below. Number 9, The Room's final confrontation did not elicit the reactions Tommy Wiseau had hoped for. While the final argument between Johnny and Lisa was misunderstood by director, writer, lead actor Wai Zhao, just like the other entries here, it is for reasons far removed from the rest. Hilariously acted, awkwardly shot, and riddled with stilted dialogue, the scene is remembered more for Wai Zhao's delivery of You're tearing me apart, Lisa, more than anything else. Seeing that this scene was meant to serve as the narrative and emotional climax of the 2003 cult classic, it is clear that Wai Zhao intended for this dramatic scene to be taken seriously by audiences. This is especially true after it was revealed by Greg Sestero, who played Mark in his book, that The Room was a semi-autobiographical account of the enigmatic director's life. Admittedly, audiences laughing at and mocking a retelling of a man's past woes is not something one would typically celebrate, but it seems that Wai Zhao has taken the reaction to his So Bad It's Good opus in his stride in the years since its debut. Number 8, Tony Kay's original American History X ending showed he missed the point of Danny's death. American History X is a brutal and unflinching exploration of racism, indoctrination, and redemption, and it features powerhouse performances from Edward Norton, Stacey Keach, and Edward Furlong. Despite its critical success, the 1998 drama all but ruined director Tony Kaye's career, though, due to his infamous disowning of the feature and creative clashes with Norton and New Line Cinema. While Kaye eventually came around to the feature years later, his alternate ending for the story showed he missed a crucial crucial components of Derek Vineyard's arc, as well as that of the consequences of Danny Vineyard's actions. The proposed conclusion would have seen Derek turn back to his neo-Nazi ways after Danny's death at the hands of a black student, in an attempt to showcase the cyclical nature of hate and violence. However, this would not have worked within the context of everything that came before, most notably Derek's change in perspective as well as the events he went through to experience said change. Both endings are undeniably bleak, but Kay's ending would have taken the film into mean-spirited and regrettably short-sighted waters. Number 7, Stanley Kubrick was unaware of the meaning behind The Shining's most well-known moment. The Shining needs little introduction, does it? Stanley Kubrick's 1980 adaptation of the famed Stephen King novel is deeply atmospheric, chilling, and is powered by Kubrick's direction. As deeply problematic as it was for Shelley Duvall, Wendy Carlos and Rachel Elkind's score, and gripping performances from Jack Nicholson and the aforementioned Duvall. As incredible as Nicholson was in the feature, his most seminal moments almost 
almost missed out on being in the movie due to Kubrick's lack of knowledge on what it referenced. The Here's Johnny line was ad-libbed by Nicholson, who did it as a homage to Johnny Carson's then popular introduction to his talk show. Kubrick was unfamiliar with the talk show because he lived in England when Carson rose to prominence and almost left it on the cutting room floor due to his notoriously meticulous nature as a filmmaker. While the line may not completely stand out to some younger viewers today, Nicholson's chillingly giddy delivery more than highlights Jack Torrance's increasingly feral threat to Wendy Torrance. Number 6. Brian Singer was not amused by the jovial nature of the Usual Suspects lineup scene. There is no denying that The Usual Suspects is a well written thriller that features committed performances from its cast, and its plot twist has justifiably become a cultural staple since the 1995 feature's release. One of its most endearing sequences is easily the lineup scene, where audiences are properly introduced to the main cast and their captivating dynamic. It is hilarious and establishes their personalities and ticks without the need for unwieldy exposition. However, director Brian Singer did not quite understand the shift in tone. The scene was originally written as a more serious affair, and because of this he was not impressed by the sudden and jocular mood on set. Despite this disconnect, he kept the scene as it was in the final cut, and the rest is history. Years after its release, scribe Christopher McQuarrie reinforced the idea that the change in tone helped the film better express its character dynamics and shared history. Cheers for stopping on by today, hit that subscribe button down below for more what culture videos you hopefully understand on your screen. Number 5. Zack Snyder's rationale behind General Zod's death demonstrated his lack of understanding of its purpose. Man of Steel is another film on this list that has a standout moment for reasons that were almost certainly not intended by the filmmakers. The 2013 Superman reboot was criticised for its joyless tone, passive titular character, and most notably its decision to have its hero kill General Zod. Director Zack Snyder has tried to defend the act, remarking that Clark's murder of the Kryptonian despot was necessary for him to establish his boundaries as a hero. Except the previous devastating bout between Superman and Zod did little to showcase the former's respect for life. In a previous scene, he even callously rebuffs Zod's desperate attempt to save the Genesis Chamber, holding various Kryptonian fetuses. What a lovely guy. Snyder's claim that Superman needed to learn the value of life would have held more weight if the hero was shown doing more to save lives in a proactive fashion, rather than recklessly responding to the threat Zod and his acolytes posed to Earth. Number 4. Sylvester Stallone regretting killing off Apollo Creed shows he did not fully understand its significance in Rocky IV. Apollo Creed's death at the hands of Ivan Drago in Rocky IV is one of the franchise's most shocking and devastating moments, and with good reason. In addition to selling Drago as a physical challenge unlike anything seen up until that point, it also leaves Rocky with one less technical and emotional anchor to fall back on. In recent years, Sylvester Stallone has expressed his regrets in killing off the and favourite character. The action legend stated he would have preferred to keep Creed alive but wheelchair bound. Additionally, the former heavyweight champion would have served as Rocky's trainer in the lead up to his clash with Drago. While seeing more of their wonderful relationship would have obviously been welcomed, the Italian stallion needed to take on this new threat alone to showcase how far he had come as a pugilist. Additionally, the trainer trainee dynamic was already done in Rocky 3, and there would have been no need to tread old ground again. We'd already seen it. Number 3. Rick Deckard's unicorn dream in Blade Runner's final cut demonstrated Ridley Scott's misunderstanding of the sequence. One of the most storied cases of extended cuts, Ridley Scott's Blade Runner has the director's cut and the final cut to go along with the 1982 theatrical version. While some changes in both editions were welcomed by fans of the sci-fi classic, one sequence involving Rick Deckard showed that the legendary filmmaker did not understand its significance regarding the protagonist's true nature in the narrative. After confronting Rachel over her replicant nature, Deckard dozes off and dreams about a white unicorn galloping through a forest. The sequence takes on a new dimension towards the movie's close, when the titular character comes across Gaff's unicorn origami. Many, Scott included, see this as confirmation of Deckard's status as a replicant, but its inclusion goes against the futuristic hunter's arc in all cuts of the picture. It undercuts Deckard's understanding of the numerous complexities of being human, as well as the layered and distinctly human nature of the replicants he was sent out to decommission without concern. 
Number 2, Spike Lee's handling of the main action set piece in Old Boy shows he misunderstood its thematic background. Spike Lee is an undoubtedly singular talent, but his 2013 remake of Park Chan-wook's haunting masterpiece does not live up to his own work or the 2003 thriller. Admittedly, there was some studio meddling in this film, especially the famed one-take action sequence, but its overall execution still demonstrates that Lee did not quite comprehend the importance of the beloved sequence in the South Korean version of Old Boy sees Oh Day Su go up against multiple thugs in a hallway that Park stated was a metaphor for the hurdles one faces in their life, as well as the irony in such challenging situations. This allegory largely feels absent in the American remake, with its changing levels and faster pace leaning into an action movie-esque excess the original did not convey. To be fair to the sequence, it is technically competent, and there is no need for a shot-for-shot -shot remake of the seminal sequence, but Lee's depiction of the protagonist's struggle lacks a personal touch that was palpable in the original. Number 1. Christopher Nolan Didn't Understand the Dark Knight's Most Famous Line Christopher Nolan is rightfully hailed as the vision behind the genre-defining Dark Knight trilogy, and the amount of work the British filmmaker put into reviving Batman's cinematic position cannot be understated. That said, he is not the sole reason behind the successful trio of movies, and one of the most legendary lines from The Dark Knight is proof of this. Brace yourselves, folks. In a Deadline article reflecting on the director's career, as well as that of frequent collaborator Killian Murphy, Nolan revealed that Harvey Dent's famous line on the fickle nature of heroism and villainy, written by his brother Jonathan, initially did not make sense to him. Despite this, he did still choose to keep the line, and only after the movie's success, and in particular the line's impact on audiences, did he finally understand its significance. While he lightly lamented not writing it, he readily acknowledged its weight in addition to finally understanding it. This was fortunate to be honest, as few lines in most movies, let alone comic book inspired ones, capture their film's thematic content as succinctly as Dent's properly tragic dying a hero one-liner. Better late than never, eh, Chris?